Good happy Thursday morning, May 14, 2020. I'm Riley King, and welcome to this Thursday morning edition of the Riley King Newscast, right here on the Riley King Network. We have a lot of news to get to this Thursday morning, so let's begin. First step, eight new COVID-19 deaths reported in New Hampshire. Antrival drug remdesivir distributed. 13 New Hampshire hospitals given dose of drug that has shown promise in fighting COVID-19. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Tyler Dumont. Let's pray. As we all hunker down in these tough times, there's still work to be done. And Mahindra is here. More equipment to protect people from COVID-19 and a drug to treat people who have it arrived in New Hampshire this week. As businesses continue to flex up open voluntarily, the state has made sure that masks will be available to them. Governor Chris Sununu says the state has already handed out millions of masks with plans to continue adding to its PPE stockpile. Earlier this week, we secured another 7 million masks. They arrived here in New Hampshire, which will be sent to health care facilities and small businesses across the state. And we expect another 10 million masks to arrive later this week. Medical gowns are in high demand nationwide, but the governor says the Granite State will receive another 50,000 this week thanks to two local companies, Circular Blue in Bradford and Coltec in Unity. The governor used the acquisition to tout public-private partnerships. And in total, uh, approximately $25 million has now gone uh, towards New Hampshire companies manufacturing, procuring, and securing PPE uh, for the state of New Hampshire. Meanwhile, the state didn't pay anything for a federal shipment of remdesivir, an investigational drug just authorized by the FDA to treat adults and children with severe COVID-19 symptoms. 400 vials of the medication arrived Tuesday and were distributed same day to 13 hospitals around the state, according to Health Commissioner Lori Chibonette. All of them have received the emergency use author authorization to go along with that medication. Now, currently, remdesivir can only be administered through an IV. New Hampshire DHHS officials have told hospitals that it will be up to them to prioritize who gets the medication from their limited supply. Reporting live in Concord, Tyler Dumont, WMUR News 9. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. And now let's take a look at your coronavirus in New Hampshire key information. And here is a look at that COVID-19 in New Hampshire key information. There are 3,299 number of people in New Hampshire who have tested positive for COVID-19. 1,388,200 number of people in the United States who have tested positive. 150 number of deaths from COVID-19 in New Hampshire. 326 number of people who have been hospitalized with COVID-19 in New Hampshire. And 83,715 number of deaths from COVID-19 in the United States. This map right here of New Hampshire shows you current cases of COVID-19 in towns and cities of New Hampshire. Salem, 104. And this map here shows you total cases of COVID-19 in New Hampshire in towns and cities. Salem, 197. Now let's take a look at this chart here. New cases each day in New Hampshire in the purple, daily new positive COVID-19 cases in the orange, new hospitalizations, and in the red, death. 
this chart here, current cases in the purple, current COVID-19 cases, and in the orange, current hospitalizations. In this chart here, total cases in the purple, total COVID-19 cases. In the orange, total hospitalizations. In the red, deaths, and in the blue, recovered. And now this chart right here shows you by age group. This chart here shows you by female and male. And this chart here shows you risk information. This chart here shows you race slash ethnicity of cases. And this chart here shows you percent of New Hampshire population. And your common symptoms, fever, lack of smell, cough, chills, and difficult breathing. How it spreads. And prevention tips. And be sure to stay with the Riley King Network for all the latest of your COVID-19 information. New Hampshire secure more PPE increases testing in response to COVID-19. Health officials say state soon could be conducting more than 2,000 tests per day. Let's take a listen to that video from WMUR News 9, Adam Sexton. Chapel Tractor has been in our family since 1955, when great-grandfather Pearlie and grandfather George decided... Another wave of personal protective equipment, or PPE, is arriving at the state stockpile for distribution. 17 million masks this week, along with 50,000 medical gowns, a high-demand item produced right here in New Hampshire by Circular Blue in Bradford and Coltec LLC in Unity. Uh, securing gowns has, uh, continues to be not just for New Hampshire, but for governors all across the country, uh, we hear it's one of the toughest things to uh, secure in terms of PPE. It's a very high-need item. The state is still trying to boost its daily COVID-19 testing average to 1,500 and beyond. Health officials say just yesterday they exceeded 1,900 and could hit more than 2,000 later this week. The state is averaging 211 antibody tests per day with under 3% testing positive. And efforts to reach comprehensive long-term care facility testing continue. Between 30 and 40 percent of all long-term care nursing home residents have been tested to date in the state of New Hampshire. And we still anticipate that uh, all nursing home residents will have been tested within two weeks. The state is still trying to address a shortage of available workers at long-term care facilities. The extra $300 weekly stipend for frontline workers in those facilities is now going out to more than 22,000 employees statewide. Since its launch, more than $6 million in payments have gone out the door, with another $5 million committed a week uh, going forward. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. What might reopening look like for Massachusetts businesses? Governor Baker's plan due to be released next week. Let's take a listen to that video from WCVB Boston. light in the darkness. Our mission since the earliest days of electricity. Suddenly, it means so much more. Typical of what you'll see when you see a dentist or a hygienist. Paul Johnson is geared up and ready. This pediatric dentist in Wellesley has turned his waiting room into a screening room and restaged his office for a safe return of about 50% of his regular clientele. We have two rooms here. These are individual. There's beyond six feet. We have two entrances that we're going to utilize so people are kind of never really crossing paths. While a lot of this is new, a lot of it isn't new. We are very used to uh, universal precautions. Many dentists are hoping to be part of phase one. So are restaurants. There's a lot of places that aren't going to make it, and that's sad, and it's unfortunate because 
It, it's, it's not a gain for anyone who's in the business. It's a loss. Damien DePaolo runs two restaurants in the North End, and takeout only isn't paying the bills. He and other owners say they can create safe dining in in a limited capacity by incorporating social distancing, sanitizing, temperature checks, face coverings, and even blocking off restrooms. Any establishment that opens is ultra incentivized to make it as safe for their own staff as it is for their patrons because they don't want to have to close again. Still, infectious disease experts say no matter what opens first, people with compromised health should be staying home. We want to make sure that we're not experimenting or testing our new phases on those types. <laughs> Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Some main unemployed receiving benefits above average salary. Let's take a listen to that video from WMTW News 8 Maine. Channel 8 Senior Shoutouts. While Brunswick's The Great Impasta is limited to takeout service, owners Lena Valick and Chris Orr say half their staff of 24 is not working. Some of them choose uh, because they feel safer at home, and so that's perfectly fine by us. For they're them. not in a rush to come back. They're able to get almost better than what they were getting, in some cases better than what they were making regularly. Better because everyone who's lost a job due to the coronavirus crisis gets a $600 a week boost to their unemployment benefit, whether their job was full-time or part-time. Last year, Maine's average unemployment benefit was $351 a week, or 48% of the average weekly wage of $736. The $600 boost drives the average benefit to $951 a week. That's a 129% replacement rate, the highest in the country. Anybody who's lost their job, I don't think, views it as a gift, uh, no matter the... The reason. Maine so, Center for Economic Policy allow, Executive Director Garrett Martin place. says the boost is helping families pay their rent or mortgage while observing social distancing and stay at home orders. In this moment, we should be doing everything we can to, pro to support families and make sure that we can adhere to public health guidance and that we can do so without uh, significant economic disruption. The National Federation of Independent Businesses opposed the boost, saying the extra money drives a wedge between employers and employees and creates a disincentive for employees to return to work. Scott Cowger, owner of the Maple Hill Farm Inn in Hollowell, says the boost frees him to spend more of his federally backed small business loan on overhead instead of payroll. We really need that money to pay for our ongoing expenses, our, our monthly payments to the bank. Like the employees at the Great Impasta, Cogger says his staff is anxious to come back when he's allowed to fully reopen. We're glad to know that our employees are doing okay on unemployment. Uh, we've paid into the unemployment system for 28 years, and I've never had to lay off anybody. The boost is set to last through July. In Brunswick, Phil Hirschkorn, WMTW News 8. Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Free COVID-19 tests now available for Vermonters showing no signs of symptoms or illnesses. Hundreds of community members signing up through Health Department website. Let's take a listen to that video from NBC5 Vermont. Introducing awesome at home from Dan O'Brien Auto Group. Log on to any Dan O'Brien Auto Group website. The health department now opening COVID-19 pop-up test sites all over the state. And for the first time, you do not need to show any symptoms or a doctor's referral to get one. We are expanding our testing capability quite aggressively in this state. So at some point, the, the objective is that Everybody that wants a test will get a test. It's essentially at that point now, and thousands of Vermonters are signing up.
for a free nasal swab test through the health department website. We also got word on the next phase of economic reopening. On Friday, we'll be extending the state of emergency, and we'll have a few additional announcements as well. Those expected to include reopening of marinas, RV parks, and campgrounds, and lodging properties, too, starting next week, in time for Memorial Day. But only for Vermont residents and those who've self-quarantined here. Visitors can come starting June 15th. The governor also plans to release a roadmap for the rest of the restart on Friday. Asked again when bars and restaurants might reopen, he remained cautious given the risks. Said when they do, will be restricted to 25% occupancy. Uh, don't take this lightly, uh, but we don't take the virus lightly uh, either. And we need to do all we can to have this phase um, measured response and opening. So we'll all have uh, some more options for the Memorial Day weekend coming up, and we'll have more details coming Friday. We'll, of course, have live coverage. Brian? Okay, and there you go on that video and that report. Convertry police arrest West Warwick woman accused of arson at a Walmart. Convertry police said Wednesday they arrested a West Warwick woman accused of arson at a Walmart last week. Police said the 22-year-old went inside the Walmart Super Center in Convert Friday afternoon and set towels on fire while it was occupied with customers. The woman was charged with first-degree arson and proceeded at the Convery Police Department headquarters. She was later released. The 22-year-old is scheduled for an arrangement at 3rd District Court in Warwick at a later date. Suspension on plastic bag tax extended until June 30th. Governor Ned Lamont has extended the suspension on the state's plastic bag tax due to the COVID-19 pandemic. The suspension was set to expire on May 15th. Back in March, Governor Ned Lamont issued an executive order that suspended the state's 0.10 plastic bag tax at grocery stores. The decision was made over concerns that reusable bags might spread COVID-19. During his daily update, on the coronavirus outbreak on Wednesday, Lamont said that suspension would expire on May 15th, but then signed an executive order extending the suspension. Lamont's chair of staff, Paul, said the tax will come back over time and that they are working with the industry and environmentalists at this time. He said they expected to release more information on Thursday today. Read the full executive order here, and we will share this link with you on the Ragley King Network Facebook page after this broadcast. Stock features stall in Viatil session as Wall Street tries to stem the latest wave of selling. U.S. stock features were little changed early Thursday after concerns over U.S. economy and the market's overall volatility sparked another sell-off in equities a day 
earlier. Calls for federal action on social distancing on flights. Let's take a listen to that video from ABC News. Americans beginning to travel again, the images and of course the questions tonight for the airlines who all seem to have different policies, no central set of rules, and some passengers are rightly concerned. ABC's Gio Benitez covers aviation. Passengers all over the country are sharing photos of flights they believe are too crowded during a pandemic. The number of domestic flights down nearly 70 percent, but more people are beginning to fly. Now tonight, calls for federal action on social distancing. Airlines have imposed their own policies, but they're not all the same. American Airlines says it is blocking half of all middle seats. United says it is trying to keep a seat open beside every passenger, but doesn't guarantee it. And Delta says it is only booking half of first class and 60% of the main cabin. Senator Richard Blumenthal says the government should step in. Do you think this is something that Congress would take up? If the Department of Transportation fails to do its job, Congress should do it for them. And David, tonight every major airline tells us if you don't feel comfortable, they will change your flight, even if you've already boarded the plane. David? All right, you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the ABC News YouTube channel. If you'd like to get more videos... Okay, and that does it for this morning edition of the Riley King Newscast right here on the Riley King Network. Thank you for watching and joining us this morning. I'll see you back here later on today for another broadcast. I'll have a news report coming up in a little bit. Goodbye, everyone.